Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning, my name is Danielle Fisher. I'm a researcher here at Microsoft Research in Information and Data Visualization. It's a rare opportunity that we have today to uh, be greeted and uh, spoken to by Al Inzelberg. Al, I should, by the way, for those of you watching virtually, I need to give you a warning. Al tends to reward really good questions with chocolate. And while I will be on link, so if you want to ask any questions online, I can relay them. Um, the chocolate will be more difficult to uh, send through campus mail. So if you're like sitting up there in your office on third or fourth floor and you're contemplating whether to come down, I'm just saying. <laughs> Al Inzelberg has a long and distinguished history. Virtually any university that you can contemplate, he has uh, served some time speaking at. Um, although his PhD is from University of Illinois, right? And mathematics and physics. He was at IBM Research for a number of years before he uh, has moved to uh, UCLA, University of Southern California, eventually to the Technion and Ben Gurion University. He's now concluding a one-month tour in the United States by joining us here at Microsoft Research to talk about some of his seminal work in uh, parallel coordinates. And with that, I'd like to welcome the founder, of, uh, the creator of parallel coordinates, and a fantastic raconteur, Alan Zuberg. <laughs> wow. Thank you very, very much, Daniel. Uh, what can I say? I appreciate it. Uh, take it with a grain of salt, or maybe even with a rock of salt, as he said, but it's nice. Uh, I wasn't aware of the fact that uh, there is an audience, but much of it is virtual. I shall do my level best to also entertain them. Uh, I, I, since we will be talking about visualization of some sort, let us start with this semi-unserious. Uh, uh, icon, and uh, you might notice that uh, uh, you have an opportunity to do some extrapolation in the years <laughs> and use your imagination and all that, but uh, I, I want to point out that uh, in the demos I will be using real data, and as an example, this magnificent specimen here turns out to be real. And those are the panties of Queen Victoria, which were found in the museum. And you can read it in German. And it also says that uh, the girth was 140 centimeters. It does say that. And some people even suggested that that may be the real Victoria's secret. But <laughs> we will not contemplate on it. OK, so as Daniel very, very graciously uh, mentioned, uh, we will be talking about parallel coordinates and some of the things that we can do with them. A bit of history. I, I was not in the past interested in data at all. Rather, when I was young, and that was a long time ago, I, I fell in love with geometry. And uh, I particularly enjoyed the fact that in geometry would be given a problem, and I could draw uh, the problem. Ah, already people. They heard about the chocolates. Yes. Hello. Uh, you could draw, make drawings about the problem. This is Tanya. She was my student at Hebrew University also a long time ago. Fantastic. And if I have a chance, I want to sh show some of very nice work that she did in those days. Your, your, your alma mater? So now we see that alma really does matter. <laughs> okay. Um, so as I said, I, I love geometry uh, because I could make pictures uh, about problems, interact with whatever is in between with the picture, <coughs> get inside, redraw the picture, redo it. Those days we didn't have computer graphics. And I felt that I really understood what was going on the moment I could learn how to make good pictures about that problem. 
So as uh, my studies proceeded, I, I learned about multidimensional geometry. And uh, the learning process was the, something like professor would put an equation on the board and say this is a hyperplane. Another equation, this is a hypersphere. Yet some more, this is a hypersurface. All these hypers. And I couldn't see a blasted thing other than equations. So here were this, this man talking geometry, but playing around with equations, and no pictures. And I had felt instinctively that it should be illegal to try to do geometry without pictures. So I had a burning desire to come up with a way to make multidimensional pictures of some sort, and had noticed that as I would discuss this idea with my friends, they would dis distance themselves from me, so I decided not to. Anyway, so in the course of time, I looked at a number of ideas that people had come up with in uh, statistical graphics, and that didn't work out. So I want to, for the fundamental idea uh, that Rene Descartes gave us, uh, namely coordinate system, where by means of a co the, uh, coordinate system, we can actually transform an equation to a picture, not lose information, learn a great deal from the picture, go back and forth. I said, wow, if we could only do that for functions, relations that had many variables. And then back into geometry, the idea came up that in geometry, the fundamental concept is parallelism and not orthogonality. Uh, we have Euclid's fifth axiom that speaks about the existence of parallel lines, uh, but we don't have anything in the axioms about angles. So to speak about angles, first of all, a new concept has to be introduced and then make specific choices and what have you. In short, parallelism is really the fundamental notion and not orthogonality, and they're not equivalent. So I said, well, let's try and construct a coordinate system with parallel coordinates. And here's how it works. If we want to do something in five space, or if we are uh, interested in displaying data with, say, five variables, uh, we take a copy of the plane, take five copies of the real line, place them equidistant and parallel to each other, uh, label them with whatever labels are appropriate for the problem, and also superimpose a Cartesian coordinate system, something which people often forget, and it's, it's a pity because it is useful. Okay, and we take the first component of, say, a point in five space. Uh, we measure it on the first axis, the second component of the second axis, third on the third axis, and so forth. And to indicate that all this is to be considered as one entity, we join the corresponding values with straight lines. And what we have done is we have constructed a one-to-one -one mapping between, say, uh, uh, ordered quintuples and polygonal lines whose vertices are in the parallel axis. By polygonal lines, I really mean to take the full line. And you see that we need to, why is that useful? OK, well, and of course, we haven't lost any information because from the picture, we can recover the numbers. We can keep on adding axes. Wow. I cannot tell you how much I regret that this definition is so simple. And the reason I regret it is because where is the copy of the book someplace? Thank you. And the reason I regret it is because people t tend to look to read the papers. They read the definition. They say, I got it, and do not read the rest and proceed to try and solve problems which have already been solved. You see, it's quite a bit. And it's, it's a pity. So this is what it is. And simple as it is, uh, we can add a lot of additional ideas, partially, uh, partly part of them, very nice ideas that Tanya contributed in her project in my class there, and, and do some very interesting things. But even with a simple idea, we can still do some useful stuff, which is why lots of people, believe it or not, use parallel coordinates. 
And let me illustrate. So here I'm showing you uh, a map. Uh, it's a portion of Slovenia, a very nice country in Europe. And I was there. I was working on some data with uh, an economics group, group in economics. And close to us was a group of people uh, looking at data uh, that were collected by satellite. Uh, don't ask me about the physics because I don't know them, but depending on the ground, there are different emissions that the Earth gives, and they can be distinguished and measured. So the satellite in this particular case was measuring seven different types of, so we say, radiation from the ground from each particular point. And uh, the purpose of the exercise is by looking at the data to be able to tell what's on the ground, whether it's water, forest, chickens, rockets, whatever. So they said, okay, would you mind looking at our data and see what we shall see? So the first thing I ask you when you see uh, data uh, displayed in parallel coordinates, do not let the picture intimidate you, because it does look intimidating, especially if you haven't seen too many before. Okay, so when we put all the data that we have for this problem, this is what we get. So let's try to understand. We have a rectangle, uh, the region in the map. Uh, this is Windows 7, so you guys make it in strange ways. I pop one window. In. Okay. Uh, anyway, so um, I'm just going to choose one data point and look at it. Uh, okay, so remember, uh, a data point in parallel coordinates looks like a polygonal line, something like this. So we have seven measurements and a position. So here now is what the data, uh, what, the, uh, what the polygonal line tells us. It gives us the x-coordinate of the point where the measurements are made and also the y-coordinate. So the first two axes specify the point and the, uh, the remaining seven axes give us the seven numbers that were measured at that point. So from our point of view, we could think of it in the abstract. We have this rectangle and seven numbers that aliens sent associated with each point. So we would like to know what, if anything, uh, we can learn from it. Okay, please look in the lake, this strange looking lake, with a finger. And remember, the name of the game in visualization uh, is pattern recognition. So I would like to draw the lake for you, but from the picture. In fact, it might be better if I do it over there. So let me, not from the data. So I see a pattern here. And here's the lake from the data. Can't get this thing positioned right. OK, so I chose this uh, part of the data. And I get the lake. So people were quite amazed, they said, wow, what's going on, blah, blah, blah. And while they were looking at each other in awe, I saw another pattern, which enables us to take the water out of the lake and return it. So this is almost in real time. And uh, they, they really did admire it. Uh, there, if you work harder, you can come up with rules uh, to distinguish the green regions, the built-up areas, and what have you. But this is, this is nice and quick, which is why I do it. So they liked it very much. And they said, OK, fine, all these things, patterns. Is there a way that you could do this automatically? Of course, what they meant is, can you come up with a classifier? And there are lots of classifiers, algorithms which do classify, that uh, may be able to do this automatically. But I thought it would be fun to try and do it uh, you know, based on some geometric ideas and using parallel coordinates internally. So I worked on such a thing. And uh, I was visiting a group at Yale that I work with, very good group, mathematicians, computer scientists. 
they asked me, what are you doing? And I said, uh, you know, I'm working on a classifier. So said, that's great because uh, uh, people from the medical school gave us uh, a data set. And they want classification. And we have not been able to do it. And we sent it to some of our friends. And they were also not able to do it. And the doctors are making fun of us, which is an unbearable insult. So I said, OK, we'll try it. So they bring the doctors over uh, with the data and explaining what it is about. And here's the data. It's, it involves 33 variables, which is <laughs> starting to be respectable. And uh, what they did is they took a poor monkey and they stuck electrodes on its brain. And I instinctively made a face. And one of the doctors assured me that it doesn't hurt. So I said, if it doesn't hurt, why didn't you do it on yourself? <laughs> so I was asked by my friends not to make such remarks and to concentrate on the problem. So here's the data. They took this poor monkey, and they claimed to have placed electrodes on two, diff two and only two different types of neurons. So the first axis is categorical, neurons of type 1, neurons of type 2. And then they gave the monkey some pictures to look at, and the neurons started firing. And the good doctors claimed to be able to distinguish 32 different spikes, pulses, and measure them. So here is uh, a sample, a data point, and it says this is uh, a neuron of type 2 and pulse of type X1 has this amount, X2 this amount, and what have you, all the way to 32. So there, there are 33 variables altogether. One of them is the category. OK, so what the doctors wanted to classify, or wanted to be able to do, was to look at the firing neurons and to be able to tell with precision whether it's neuron of type 1 or type 2. And my friends, told me this just hadn't been able to do it. So I sel we select here neurons of type 1. And these are the blue guys. So what we want is a rule to distinguish the blue guys from the white <coughs> guys. OK, so that is going to be the input to our classifier. And here's the answer. So it gives us the answer in terms of conditions and the variables, which is very nice, unlike neural networks. But more important, we can see the answer. And that is really fun. So sorry, is that saying within the ranges between those? Correct. Those? You have to be within these ranges. Notice it's Q2 minus Q3, and then take that out. So it's a complement. It's called nested cavities. You will see why in a moment. You grab what you want, you have everything you want, but it's too much, then you take things out and put back. The name nested cavity is the name of the classifier. Absolutely enthused my dentist. <laughs> how would you deal, how would the poor dentist deal with nested cavities? Anyway, but that does not get carried away. So the first result that we have from the classifier is that it only needs uh, nine out of the 32 variables. If we are in three space and we throw points, it can happen that they can all fall on a single plane. Okay? So it can very well be that even though we are three dimensional, this particular, the specific subset that we're looking at is actually two dimensional, true dimensionality. So it finds the true dimensionality of the problem. Now, in many dimensions, 32, 33, there's lots of space. So it's quite likely that if you throw lots of points, they may not be dispersed all over the space, and you may be able to concentrate them in a subspace like that. And it found that it's nine, uh, nine, and it finds it in a very efficient way, nice way. So it finds nine and chooses the best nine. We will see the criteria in a moment, why, and orders them according to their, uh, you will see in a moment, uh, the power to separate the two classes. First of all, let me show you uh, the first two variables as they were given in the data set, x1 and x2, the first adjoining variables. 
So we see that the two classes are quite mixed, even in two, two dimensions. So we have a real problem. Now let's see what the classifier is able to do. And these are, don't do that. Uh, this is what the classifier found, the best two variables, uh, which is remarkable. I mean, we looked at that. And uh, we understood why the traditional classifiers hadn't worked. Uh, because typically, people try to separate clusters by putting planes between them. And this isn't going to do it. Uh, also, ne nearest, uh, nearest neighbor ideas will not work because they are very, very close together. So, and of course, doctors saw that and said, wow, we didn't realize our data set had holes. I thought that this looks a little bit like a banana. So I said, that's probably what the poor monkey was <laughs> fantasizing while they were torturing. Anyway, so here is, uh, now we are actually looking at the rule. Here's the rule explicitly, but we are seeing uh, what it does. Notice x, x11, x14, and it gives us a roadmap of going down this way and seeing further best sections in some sense. And we see that as we proceed this way, the separation between the classes becomes less pronounced. And this is the criterion for choosing the order. So what, what has happened here uh, in, in a very efficient way, the classifier went into this 32-dimensional set of data points, uh, chose a nine-dimensional subspace, and found these two very strange pretzels winding in nine dimensions, tightly coiling around each other. So uh, it, it, it's nice, and uh, you give the doctors you know, a very good idea about the structure of their data. We have their rule explicitly. What is left is to get a measure of how accurate is the rule. And let's that, do that quickly with train and test. So typically, I let the software choose two-thirds of the data at random. You can choose any number you want to. And construct the rule based on two-thirds. And then test that rule on the one-third. And here's the answer. We can see false positives about 5%, negatives about 3%, some kind of an average about 4%. Very accurate, very fast get the rule both explicitly and you can see it, which is fun. Now, the parallel coordinates are internal to this. And I wanted to go a little bit into the very nice geometry that enables us to do that. Uh, and a good way to get started is to look at uh, how we could describe the plane, the two-dimensional plane itself, in terms of parallel coordinates. Of course, we can describe it with orthogonal coordinates. So since it is two dimensions, we only need two axes. Take a point. Always remember we have the x-y coordinate system. We do the same thing. First coordinate on the first axis, second coordinate on the second axis, and join them. So we see that a point is represented by a line. And it's fair then to ask, how can a line be represented? And here's the answer. And it is both nice and surprising. Here's the line. We choose some points in a line. Uh, each one of these points in parallel coordinates is a line. And continue. So we, here we have a bunch of points. Here we have a bunch of lines. But remarkably, the lines intersect. Very important. And it's not. Uh, accidental. It happens all the time. And the proof is very quick and fun. If we take a line in two dimensions, given, say, by two parameters, in this case, slope and intercept, and uh, take one point, transfer it over here, and see it as a line, another point, and see it as a line. Now, since we do have the xy coordinate system, we find the equations of these two lines. And we find the point of intersection. 
And we see that the point of intersection is independent of these two, two points and depends only on the two parameters which specify the line, M and B. D is whatever distance we choose between the axes, which we can take as one. So that's very nice, because uh, it tells us that we have duality, a very nice transformation in mathematics. Uh, points go into lines, and lines go into points. Perfectly OK, because we, to specify a line in 2D, we just need two numbers, two parameters. And to specify a point, we also need two numbers, so we should be able to make a, such a correspondence. There is an important detail, which we see here with the division, uh, which says, and it's known in mathematics, that in order to do duality properly and completely, you have to do it in the projective plane. It's all in the book. You're welcome to look at it. It's a fun thing to do. So we do have the first very nice property in parallel coordinates. And again, because I suspect most of you are interested in data exploration rather than a course in multidimensional geometry, which I would have much preferred. <laughs> uh, let's illustrate that. And let us see how duality can help us make money which is something that lots of people talk about. So here is a data set, a financial data set, that was given to me by four experts working on Wall Street and making over a million dollars a year, which I suspect is a bit more than some of you are making here. And they said, OK, here's the data set that will explain. We know everything. And we'd like to see what, if anything, you can discover, kind of testing the methodology, which is fine. So the data set consists is actually uh, data given every Monday of the year. So some years have 53 Mondays, and years still have 12 months. And this was data the year 1985 to 93. There were. Uh, we were given the price of the sterling in dollars. There was no euro there, so this was a Deutsche Mark in dollars. Yen in dollars, two interest rates, short term and long term, three month treasury bonds, 30 year. These are just the interest rates. Uh, price of gold and S&P 500. Okay, and I knew abs absolutely nothing about this. So we started exploring. And you can do lots of things. Again, don't let the picture intimidate you. It looks like a bunch of scribbles. There's really a lot of information here. And interactivity is essential in getting it out, in my opinion. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's not a matter of opinion. Uh, I really do not believe in static visualization. And that is no longer exploration. That's presentation, which is legitimate. But to explore, you need to be able to interact because you have to remove different parts. When people using parallel coordinates speak about overplotting, they're really not thinking of the power interactivity because you can have as many things as you want to, as long as you can choose parts of them, see patterns, and, and uh, recognize the patterns and remove that from the picture, then you can work with the display. OK, so let's take one year. 1986. And uh, okay, we see that uh, the stock market was uniformly low. We have this somewhat strange gap in the gold, which we will explore. Uh, we have a lot of volatility in the interest rates, but still roughly in the mid range. And here we have something which was unusual for those times uh, that the yen was the most volatile of the three currencies. Uh, not true in general. The yen was quite stable. We will see that in a moment. And let's take another year so that we can compare. Let's take 92. And immediately we see the difference. All the information is there. High stock market, low gold, low interest rates. Here the yen is stable. Well, the sterling is all over the, the place. And those of you who follow these things might remember that that was the year that George Soros speculated on the sterling. And you can see 
the nature of the speculation. Okay, so we promised to say something about making money. Uh, so let's do it. Okay, so back to 1986, uh, I noticed this gap again. Remember, we are looking for patterns, and uh, there are a number of philosophical discussions, some not so philosophical, but what is a pattern? As far as I'm concerned, a pattern is anything that attracts your eyes. So the gap attracted my eye, and I don't argue with myself about what is a pattern. Okay, so I was curious about uh, the gap in the gold, and I select the low gold, and notice that gold was low from the first week in January of that year to the first week in August. Something happened between the first and the second week because gold jumped and stayed. Now, what is really interesting is that low gold goes beautifully with low Deutsche Mark, not sterling or yen, just Deutsche Mark, and high short-term interest rates not long-term interest rates. So as I was saying that, the four people from Wall Street took out the little notebook and started writing that, so it was satisfying to see that maybe they didn't know everything. Okay, so there is much more here, which I don't want to spend too much time, but another pattern that we see is this intersection, which we isolate and we see that without really doing any work, we have found a cluster where there's very, very strong negative correlation between the yen and the short-term interest rates, and you can play with it. Again, interactivity. Now, of course, the reason it is negative is, if you noticed perhaps from the duality that we found, the x-coordinate of the point that represents a line depends only on the slope. And slopes uh, and lines with negative slopes, if you look at it a bit, fall between the axes. So this is a near intersection, and therefore we get a negative correlation. Okay? So we found that quite easily. There are lots, and that happens a lot. And some more exploration, which I will spare you the pain. Uh, but it's also well known uh, when you can play with uh, the rates between the currencies and see that when the rates are vary, gold moves a lot. And when the rates are fairly stable, gold does not move. So based on that insight, I said, let us suppose that we bought gold. And uh, of course, we would like to sell it when it's high. So I picked high gold, and I started looking for a pattern, and there is one. Okay, so here we have high gold, and remembering what I just told you, what do you think we will see if we plot the sterling versus the Deutsche Mark for the period of high gold, which is a year plus? Something remarkable, a perfect straight line. Uh, now, those things don't usually happen with data, but it happened here. And I will show you that it only happens when gold is high. Uh, now, what does that say? It says that the rate of exchange between these two currencies is fixed, because that is the slope. And I said, I thought it was a bit peculiar that it was fixed only when the gold was high. And then, when that disappeared, was dancing again. And I thought, well, that would be a good way if these banks, if gold is high, and these two banks have a lot of gold they would like to sell, they make a deal, and uh, 
until they get rid of the gold. And then after that, they just let their currencies float. So I suggested in one of the conferences when I saw that, that maybe there is a bit of, shall we say, manipulation. But it was speculation. I didn't accuse anybody of anything. However, in less than a month after that, I received an invitation from Her Majesty's Treasury. They said, well, they would be happy if I would go there and make a presentation, and, and, and. And I was met at the door of this nice building by the river by a very proper Englishman, wearing dark suit, white shirt, speaking with a very difficult accent. And he led me in into a room with another 15 such people, very hard to understand. I said, my, my, my God, you know, if these people were any more English, they wouldn't be able to speak at all. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we did all kinds of things, and I finally showed them the straight line. And I said, would you gentlemen know anything about that? And they developed an intense interest in the cracks in the ceiling that were going like that, but you could really feel the tension. So this is an example uh, of using visualization of yes using visualization to answer questions that we did not know how to ask i had no idea that this was there and i can discuss and show you many other such cases so i wanted to make that point uh, uh, i understand that we have an hour and a half which we will break up so that you will not suffer on duty uh, let us proceed a little bit. Uh, oh, yes. Now, if uh, I can also show you how to make money on the yen, uh, but only if you promise that uh, I would get something like 10% of the... I think that's a reasonable... But there's uh, one of the really... I'm sorry, yes? The rules on the yen would have changed in the late 90s. Yeah, thank you. Uh, your name, sir? <laughs> My name is Lindsay Hughes. Excellent. I have chocolate. brought chocolate, Microsoft chocolate, to reward good remarks and questions. Uh, you, you're welcome to take some and circulate. Oh, sure. Yes. Uh, and we do have some other ones. So, uh, thank you for the remark. I, uh, that only says that one must update their data and, yeah. and their conclusions. Thank you. Okay, I want to, uh, there's lots of really fun things to do in geometry. But let me, I mean, I, I just want to emphasize the pattern idea and show you another one and another uh, way that it came up. Okay, so if I show you this pattern, well, we can immediately see that it's something that's happening in three dimensions. And uh, so we have a bunch of polygonal lines and therefore uh, a corresponding set of points in three dimensions. But they, they're not uh, random in the sense that small bunches of them intersect. And when we join the intersecting points, we get these two vertical lines. We are looking, believe it or not, at coplanar points coplanar, the same plane. Even in three dimensions, if you have a plane and choose some points and then take the plane away, unless you look at them the right way, you could miss them. But here, it doesn't depend on the viewpoint. It works in any dimension, n minus one vertical lines. Let me just illustrate. Oh, by the way, here's the duality, point to line, another point, another line. Whatever I do here happens over there. Now let's go on to planes. Hmm. Okay, so uh, the reason we get that, oops, oh, I killed it. Apologies, folks, just a minute. No. Uh, no, I didn't want to press that. It was just uh, misappropriated enthusiasm. Uh, Yes. OK. 
coming, coming, coming. Okay, so we have uh, coplanar points. And I was showing you this pattern. Now let's see where it comes from. So if we have a plane in 3D, as in here, we can build uh, a new coordinate system using, say, these lines, intersection of the plane with the x2, x3 axis and with the x1, x2 axis. So we can build a new coordinate system basically taking lines parallel to this line, taking lines parallel to that, that, and then looking at the grid points. And the grid points show up here. And it is exactly the grid points that give us this property. You can play with it and it works for any plane. So, if we have grid points on a plane, we can recognize the coplanarity immediately. It works, as I said, in any dimension. And uh, armed with this very important information, uh, I will show you an application. here. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, as uh, uh, David mentioned, I used, no, I used to work for IBM, otherwise known as the International Brotherhood, Brotherhood of Magicians. We were magicians in those days, but perhaps not anymore. And uh, while there and doing this work, one of the industrial divisions uh, heard that we were doing such work. So said, okay, we are measuring uh, some very important multivariate, multidimensional data. We'd like to see if you guys can spot something. So they sent us the data. I did not really expect anything. And uh, one of the permutations came up like that. And I happened to notice this thing. Remember, we're looking for patterns. And it reminded me of this. And I said, OK, let's isolate it and plot them the, just this. And sure enough, it's here. It really is a straight line. Uh, so I thought it's remarkable. Why? I mean, this is industrial data that you would get this sort of a pattern that there's some sort of coplanarity. But for coplanarity, we need at least two lines. And I could only find one. What does it mean to have half a plane? Well, it was fun. Uh, if you plot this guy against versus this guy also, this, this is the equivalent, uh, we see that we have a bunch of parallel lines. So we can tell that this and that are linearly related with a number, another parameter that is not being measured. So we're able to tell these people that there is a variable with a linear relationship here, apparently important, that is not showing up in your measurements. And they went and they found it. And they were so happy they sent us a check. And this doesn't happen very often. It's, by the way, this is, it's very nice when you're able to help the people who take the measurements improve what they're doing by adding variables that are missing. OK, this was one example of that. Another is also uh, con uh, connected with income. Uh, we will be taking a break in a moment. But I want to show you this example. Uh, I was invited by a company in Belgium that makes chocolates, Belgium, they make great chocolates, uh, to go over and help them with some uh, data analysis. So I went there and they explained to me that uh, they have to buy cocoa. Uh, and the cocoa commodity market is pretty crazy in the sense that the very sharp changes in the price overnight, 10, 15%, one way or another. So you can win or lose a lot. So they've been trying to build a model of the cocoa commodity market for some time. They weren't too happy, so they 
went into a meeting, but before that they gave me some data and said, look at it, and when we come out, we'll discuss it. So what do we have here? They gave me data for one market year. They had 251 actually active market days. And this is volume, the amount in dollars or some currency that was traded. Uh, again, I don't know that much about the variables. They often do not want you to know too much about the variables. This is another kind of volume. This is uh, information on contracts that are open. That means they're still being negotiated, and they haven't closed, and they monitor that. It turns out it's a very smart thing to do. This is profit and loss, which they measure. Of course, if profit is negative, then it's a loss. And these are future prices, price three months, six months, and so on. So they gave me that and went happily to their meeting. And I was looking at it and immediately saw this pattern again that I showed you. I said, wow, that's very interesting. Let's look at it. And this is what it looks like. So I said, you know, this stock, uh, the, the cocoa commodity market is not so crazy. I mean, it seems to like kind of linearity. And then something causes it to break. So I said, OK, let me look at some of these things and see if we can learn something. So using, again, point to line duality, I'll pick one of the straight line intervals, but I will choose it here from its corresponding point. So here, here, say, the first one. So I choose the first one, and immediately I see that there's an outlier in the profit and here. So please look at the last point. I choose the outlier, and that was the last trade. I said, wait, this is interesting. Could that be true of some of the other ones? So I go and look for some more. I don't know, let's pick this one. Mm -hmm. And I choose this one again. Again, we see an outlier. Look at this guy. Last trade. So I did it, and something like 67% of the cases was like that. I said, wow, I can give them 24-hour notice because the, uh, the outlier is the last trade. After that, it breaks. Now, I couldn't tell yet whether it's up and down, but that's it. Very nice information. And I showed them they were thrilled. And how do I know that they were thrilled? Because they gave me the contract to do the big job, which I'll show you with a very nice result. But then I happened to notice that I had trouble kind of in this time, because here there wasn't so much regularity. That, and one of the people who was working the model uh, remembered that, first of all, this is summer. And he remembered that that year there was a, a revolt in the Ivory Coast, a rebellion in the Ivory Coast where they produced a lot of cocoa. So we can use parallel coordinates as a rebellion detector. So <laughs> anyway, so uh, let me show you the big thing. And that, that, that turned out to be really fun. And so they gave me the data uh, now on 10 years. And here it is, year 82 to 92. So again, I found this phenomenon. I was able now this time to get very nice indicator whether it's going to go up or down, really valuable stuff. But there was something especially pleasing as a mathematician that I noticed. Uh, here's the graph of profit and loss. Again, loss is negative, profit is positive. And versus price difference. This is the opening minus the closing price. And we get this very, very beautiful butterfly pattern, but for the losses. So I was intrigued with that, and I said, let's, let's explore them. And uh, let's see, get rid of this. So I wanted to just take the butterfly. Again, 
Got to, you guys got to do something with Windows. This is very. OK, so I um, just want the butterfly. OK, got the butterfly. Now I am going to choose a variable that I can't tell you what it is, a range of it. OK, here's a variable. Please notice something unusual. Here we get two perfect straight lines. Folks, this is cocoa commodity data. It's not something that comes from physics. So I said, wow, that's nice. Now we're going to make the butterfly fly. Look at the straight lines, opening beautifully. It was really spectacular. Uh, we found the formula and nonlinear and all that. They were able to use this, uh, they told me, for a risk analysis model, because this is about the losses. But I was so thrilled, this is a pretty result. And I said, guys, we really have to publish it. It's a shame. Said, no, you will not publish it. The competitors, blah, blah, blah. So I, I was pushing my luck, and I said, I will publish it. So one of the ladies in the team says, we will sue you. So I said, how much? She says, at least $50 million. So I said, now I know how much my work is worth. So <laughs> <laughs> I could not persuade them to get a small percentage of that. Anyway, so this was really fun. Uh, there, there are lots of kind of adventures like that. And uh, uh, again, this is an instance of visualization answering questions we did not know how to ask. Very, very important to keep that in mind. The standard stuff, the OLAPs and the all these things that take sections, which are pre-canned questions, perfectly legitimate, will miss this because we're doing exploration without any bias. OK, uh, I do not want to tire you. I want to uh, show you uh, a very nice way, I think, of making decisions in general. Uh, and also for specific applications. Uh, and uh, here is uh, an example of that. OK, we can really do geometry with parallel coordinates, multidimensional geometry. Do it and see it, and do some things that, in some sense, we're not able to do it using orthogonal coordinates. So. We can show lines, multidimensional lines, planes, and surfaces, hypersurface. So this is a hypersurface in eight space. And it is built from data on the economy of a Latin American country that I worked with the central bank. They gave me the output of the agricultural sector for many years, uh, fishing, mining, manufacturing, construction, government, so it means budgets, miscellaneous, and GNP, and using standard statistical tools, least squares. Uh, we found uh, a nice equation for the model. They gave me the equation, and then we can represent it in parallel coordinates. Again, it's all in the book. So we have a model, a visual geometrical model, for the economy of this country, or for anything for that matter, for a particular relation. Now, if we have a new point in these variables, if it falls inside this creature, it satisfies the relation. If it doesn't fall inside, it doesn't satisfy the relation. So satisfaction of the relation, sure not, is, is a completely, has a complete geometrical equivalent in this sense. So let's use this simplistic model to construct feasible economic policies for that country, which is certainly a non-trivial matter. So I'm using an interior point algorithm, uh, which you see here. And it's something that teaches us a lot. So here I'm playing around with values of the agricultural output. Let's decide that we want a lot of agricultural output for that year. So we see that once we make a decision about one variable because of the relationship, it affects everything else. Something that decision makers, and especially politicians, tend to ignore. Uh, and in this particular case, when you have a budget for the year and you use up 
a certain amount, her agriculture is going to be less for everybody else, but not just less, but in specific positions because of certain relationships and constraints within. Okay, so we have this, then we go to fishing, and a very peculiar thing happened, high fishing, low mining, and almost the, the reverse. And I happily proceeded while one of my friends there, whose name was also Alfredo, was intrigued by that, and eventually, not so long after that, I got an enthusiastic email, like Latin Americans know how to do, it says, Alfredo, you will not believe what we found. It turns out that there is a large group of migrant workers there. So when the fishing is good, they come down from the mountains to go to the fishing boats, and there are not enough of them left to work on the mines, and vice versa. That's why we couldn't construct a policy that was good for both. So unknowingly, these two sectors were competing pretty much for the same labor force. So that was very satisfying, and as I said, it's a, it's a model for um, decision uh, support. I've been trying to convince doctors who work in intensive care units to use it. There they measure many, many variables of the people who come in very sad shape inside. And uh, the, you can go and you see a list of Excel list, 30, 40 variables that they measured with the ranges that they're supposed to be in. And now, I don't know anybody that can look at 30, 40 variables supposed to be interrelated and get an idea of their interaction and how to determine the state of the patient. This Plus they used, excuse me, this idiotic idea that things should be in a box, in a, in a fixed interval, it would, which we can discuss afterwards philosophically is a very, very poor model. So I said, look, you shouldn't be doing it like that. Let's just say that you have eight variables. Let me show you what can happen. Let's say that, that the patient is such that the measurements that you have are pretty much from the center of the ranges, which is about as ideal as you can get with slight deviations. By the time you get to the end, look how much you have left. It's not this, but this. So one of the doctors who looked at that says, wow, this might explain some mysterious deaths. And we leave our lives in the hands of people that don't have the right tools. So, uh, so I said, you should be using that. So when you get a new patient in here, if you know he's diabetic, you can put in the constraint already and get a much better feel of what the actual ranges should be. Okay, so this is an idea that you may want to contemplate. But the most important idea is this. So uh, thank you for listening. Uh, we have time for questions. Lots of rewards for good questions, remarks, and jokes. Yes. I'll forgo the job that it's not good for me. It's not good for you? Wow. Well, you give it to somebody else. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, how successful have you been in... Who, who would you like to give it to? By the way, I think I deserve it. You may be. Thank How successful were you in training lay laymen mm -hmm. in using this? Because you understand the geometry, but most people don't. You, you tell them duality and they don't know what you're talking about. Mm. I was successful not only in training laymen, but also lay women. And this is a fantastic example. Tanya did an amazing piece of work. It takes... It's a very nice question, by the way. You deserve a second reward. Thank you. People, remarkably enough, liken this to Excel. And it is visual Excel, no more, no less. It's a visual spreadsheet. I take the Excel table, space separated, and that's how I expect. Takes about two hours. High school graduate. Right. They are not experts, but they are productive after two hours. Well, linear relationships. 
even non-linear, they are much more interesting. Uh, they don't do it like that. They go, and they, I tell them, look at this thing. Anything that grabs your eyes, anything that grabs your eyes. We have here three queries, which I worked very hard to come up with, call them atomic queries. And I can compose uh, much harder, I mean, more complex queries with Boolean operators. So they see this crossing. This, you don't need anything. Your eyes see that. So I said, grab it. They grab it. And I said, play with it. They can do whatever they like. I said, grab an interval on, on, on one of them. And play. Ah, looks like negative correlation. Okay. Uh, All right. From there to I'm sorry? What's the leap from there to interpretation? That is, I grabbed some random crossing of n and the three month yields. I just got fed chocolate. Same thing as yeah, yeah, but I mean, you got, you need the green one. <laughs> yes, yes then. Right, I've just decided that I'm interested in this chunk of intersection between yen and three month yield. And you showed me that once I had selected that, you know, there was an interesting relationship between yen and a bunch of other stuff. Mm -hmm. But what was that subset that I grabbed and what made it an interesting subset? <coughs> oh, what made it an interesting is your feel that you used, is the fact that they intersect. So, so something happens, something that your eye identifies. And it happens that just about any pattern that I came up with corresponded to a relationship in the data set. So by choosing, selecting the pattern and playing with it, I find relationships in the data set. But in a way, your question is, is a very good and fundamental one, like I would expect from Daniel. Daniel, I met as a student at Professor Hertz class at Berkeley in earlier days. So, we have very basic tools. You see this thing? This is a zebra. I don't know anything about the data set, and statisticians tell me that is a plus, because you come without a bias. You have no ideas. You have no beliefs, because many times the beliefs get people into trouble. That's what the statisticians tell me. By the way, this is not instead of statistics. This is in addition to statistics. You have a data set, you don't know a thing about it, start exploring, pull some properties, and then you can start making intelligent hypotheses. Okay, so I start playing. I said, well, S&P 500, everybody says this is important in the stock market. Let's explore it. So I choose it, and I do a zebra on it, which, so let's take four intervals just for the fun of it. Look, I broke it up into four intervals and colored it. Without doing a blasted thing, I see, hey, low stock market, low currencies. High stock market, well, high yen. Low gold, or I'm sorry, low gold. Lower interest rates. Things that, by reading the newspaper, I had heard about, and I start learning. What's the deal with the week? First thing in each of those weak things being yes. uh, different than the others. Ah, it's because of I the color. The <laughs> no, no, but this. I won't tell anybody. Sorry. Fine. I'll say it for I, I see I came with a whole bunch of uh, goodies from Israel. And people like them so much. <laughs> Just the last night I was looking for the one from Microsoft. I said, oh my God, they took it away. So I brought Microsoft chocolate. Uh, Look, this particular thing is the coloring. Uh, so, I think it corresponds to this 
these values of the stock market, which is, by the way, is very weird. Like it's the last. Also overprinting purple last. Yeah, that could be a. So, uh, that could be an overprint. Uh, you can play with it. By the way, that very good remark. You need interactivity. So I start with two. That that gives, and then you get a feeling. And don't. There's no reason to be afraid to go back and forth and get a feel on dynamically of what is happening. So uh, I start exploring with tools like that. Another very important uh, consideration is, uh, which surprisingly enough, you have nest the ordering. Now, uh, here I see this intersection because these guys happen to be adjacent. If they weren't adjacent, the information would still be there, but I would not see it. So what do we do? And there's a very, very pretty answer. And it also leads me to an open question which I would like to pose here. Uh, let me explain. The ordering is, is a significant uh, concern. So let's see how we handle it. Sorry. OK, uh, ideally, we would like to have all possible permutations. We could see everything. But you know, if we have n variables, n factorials really doesn't. It's not, we're not going to do that. So if we're talking about all possible pairings, that's a, the order of n squared that's quadratic. However, we can beat it. And, and, and this is a very nice thing to remember. Let's say that we have six variables. We will make a graph where the vertices of the graph are the variables. Let's do that. So here are the vertices, 1, 2, 3, variable 4, variable 5, variable 6. We will put an edge if these two variables are adjacent in the permutation that we are looking at. Okay? So look at this strange Hamilton path that is chosen at first. It's a Hamilton path, and it, it goes through every one of the vertices. So we have that, and that corresponds to a particular permutation. We rotate it another permutation. Rotate it again, and these three Hamilton paths together give us the complete graph. In other words, we have all possible edges, and therefore all possible adjacencies. And this shows that for n variables, we need over the order of n over 2 well-chosen permutations to see all possible adjacencies. And, uh, and the software constructs them. So if we are here, uh, we go, this guy is the permutation editor. And uh, so here, the 10 variables, so there, it constructs these five permutations. Let's say that for every, whatever reason, see, we're speaking about the yen, so let's say we wanted the year and the yen adjacent. So we pick the permutation where this is adjacent. We select it, we apply it. And sure enough, it does look different. So, you start with data that you don't know a thing about. And again, my statistician friends tell me, the less you know, the better off you are, because you don't start. I'm not sure I buy that, but that's just, of course, you know, there's, there's some famous books about statistician. One of them is a very good book, because I know I had it and I lent it. I'm sorry? No, no, it's not. I'm only quoting. I didn't. But there's this very famous book, and I know it's a very good book because I lent it and I never got it back. And it's called How to Tell the Liars from the Statisticians. Anyway, but no, I. Uh, so here is another permutation. So what I do with a set that I, a data set that I don't know anything about, I put it up there and I run through these permutations. And if I see a pattern I like, for example, here or here, by the way, you see this curve? That tells me there's some convexities here. So it's full of pattern. I put it, I write it on the line, on the side. And then 
Then when I'm done, I go to here and I make my own custom made permutation, <coughs> which in my opinion is the best permutation for that data set that has all the parts that I want. I can repeat, by the way, the axis as many times as I like. One thing you cannot do in orthog. And then proceed. I don't know if that fully answers your question, uh, Daniel. I'm not even sure that one can because this is a game which is akin to being a detective. I was asking something you think actually much simpler. Oh, wow. Sorry. So You ruined it. No, no, I think that was a really, that was a great answer to a, and not the question you didn't ask. Question. To a deeper, more profound question I was asking. The one that I'm asking is, I look at this, say, and I see like between the 30 year and S&P 500 is this little knot at the top. And from what you told me, that's just the year over and towards the right side, the 30 year yield, long term yield, and as uh, okay, yeah, there's this knot at the top. And from what you told me, look for those knots, they're very interesting. This thing, and I meant sort of like this big wad there. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, well, that is right. yeah. but I then go, so you're going to select that, and you know, you'll then discover that this shows some correlation between something, <clears throat> but. There's also a bunch of stuff that we've now eliminated, yes. right? Yeah. And that's, what's the thing that isn't, what's the thing that I've just eliminated? And how do I know what's oh, interesting about okay. this cluster against the other rest of the world? Very good. Uh, there's even a query about that. See, you've been anticipated. Actually, it's a, so one way to find out is to do the query and then afterwards go here and use this Boolean operator, which is the complement and redo the query and you will see what you have left and contrast. Uh, by the way, this here is turning out to be nicer than I thought. Here we're looking at something roughly elliptical. You see ellipses go into roughly hyperbolas. So without even realizing, you are discovering new useful things about finance. Well, It's like, like what you just highlighted there is sort of the, the sort of the classic uh, um, movement back and forth between between uh, uh, bonds and stocks. Um, how do you look for causality? Oh, that is, I'm very careful about that. Uh, it's not that I wouldn't like to have causality. Yeah, I know. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, first of all, these are fields I don't know anything about. So for me to go and lecture, ah, I found the cause of this, this would be very foolish. Uh, but if we're talking about specific aspects that maybe I can put a day and see by the day what is happening, at least I can give a time description of how something evolves. If you're looking for causality and you have a bit more time, I want to show you a charming piece of work, uh, which I did for the army of a small country in the Middle East, whose name I cannot mention. Uh, and I was invited, and they brought me into a room, no windows. And uh, they showed me this, and they said, uh, we took 912 trucks and divided into 11 categories, in which I didn't know what, and they wouldn't tell me. And we run them over the same track, put sound sensors, measured the noise in seven different uh, frequency ranges, and recorded it. And then took each frequency range, applied something called wavelets, got a single number, and so that for each particular car, say, or truck, sorry, we have something like that. We, have, we know the category. We have the information in some kind of a file. And this thing here is, shall we say, the noise signature. Okay. So they tell me, OK, the top five classes are Russian-made trucks. We want you to find a rule so that we can identify them at a distance from the noise they make. 
So I looked for the nearest escape hatch. I thought these people were mad. And there were two burly soldiers at the door, so it, this was not an option. But I was approached by a soldier, an unusual soldier, who happened to have a PhD in computer science and a PhD in physics. You might know, this was the Talpiot program. It's a program in Israel. And he says, Professor, I think we can do it. All of a sudden, it was we, not just me. We're so. It says, think of it as sonar of the ground. So already he kind of gave me a paradigm, a little bit towards the line. So I said, OK, let's start looking. So I start looking. Remember, it's visualization. We're looking for patterns. So I go up and down. I said, well, whatever V4 is, there seems to be that there are two populations, those that are dense here, and those that are more sparse. So in classification, if one can identify different populations, it's better to classify them separately, gives you a more accurate rule and maybe a better understanding, and then take the union of the rules. So I choose those, these, and this special soldier looked them up in the file and he says, that's amazing because all these trucks have automatic gear and only these trucks. So I said, oh, that's interesting. And these guys, the sparse ones, some, somewhere in there, have manual gear. And I remember the days I'd work in a farm, driving tractors. Tractors have manual gears. It doesn't take very long. So from a distance, you could hear the blue tractor tell the difference from the red tractor and the green. They all sounded different. Manual gears, you might say, have more of a personality. It, it's true because, so I said, okay, wow, let's go back and start, try to classify these guys. Okay, let's see, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So this is the input to the classifier. And here's the rule. Let's look at the rule, as we meant before. We have explicitly, let's look in the rule. So already this uh, tells us that these are the four, four most important variables, and in that order. So if you want to do real-time identification, uh, the fewer variables you have to measure, the faster you can do it. Also, it knows how to kind of concentrate information. This is what we want. And it suggests there might even be three populations, which is already valuable. So we have, I'm sorry, we have a rule. Let's see if it may be a, a, an accurate rule. Again, do train and test. Two thirds. And it really is quite an accurate rule, about 4%. However, this is tricky business. If you're going to start shooting, I didn't say that. I said, if. <laughs> you should <laughs> I have some information. So the question came up, is there any way, is there any kind of information we can get on the misclassified ones, the ones that it doesn't get? So it doesn't always, it isn't always possible to do that, but here it turns out that it is. So I go back and I use a rougher classifier. You will see why in a moment. <coughs> and here is the rule that we get. And where is the previous? The previous rule is this. No, sorry. Uh, there's, the, I, well, we lost it. It was more complicated. It doesn't matter. Anyway, so this is a simpler rule. But we know, we'll go back to the picture, and we, we include all those that we want, the top five, and some elements from category two, and only category two. So the misclassifieds come from here. 
So my friend looked them up and absolutely cracked up. He says, these are American-made trucks that the Russians used to copy. And hence the similarity. So this was one of those rare cases where you could get in deeper and make some very interesting. It doesn't always happen. And uh, I wish I could, uh, by the way, uh, I wish I could do more about that. And we can discuss it. Because uh, people ask you, okay, you know, I found that. Now, can you, you tell me what happened in the past? Can you make a forecast and how good? And all, all kinds of interesting, very important questions, uh, which they're not just data analysis type questions. There's an element of philosophy here. Is it, do you really believe that what happened before is most likely to happen again and and then? You know, ask the people who lost a lot of money in 2008, where you have discontinu discontinuities or catastrophes called what you like. So I know that this is not a satisfactory answer, but I tried. No, no, it's great. Um, it is? Yeah. Chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 uh, Ah, yes, yes. But, uh, I, I get that sort of question all the time. So I say, well, it's a narrative, you know. You, 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 you can pick what your causal variables are and look at the relationship to the other variables in the data set. But again, the data doesn't tell you that. Yes, I, I, you said something which I should have said, and, but you said it in a more eloquent way. For me, uh, a, a good data analysis exploration supposed to craft a story. You go back and you say, this is what I found, this is what I think it means. Now, it may not be true, but you're doing your level best to give it structure. And uh, if you, we have four more minutes, one of the other interesting stories, and I have several, is I was looking at some data from a large uh, oil company. Different prices of crude. I had no idea how many crudes there were products, alternative energies, uh, storage, amounts in storage, distillery, utilization. I mean, the fascinating thing is you get into fields, which as a mathematician, you never dreamt of. So the guy was dealing with a very nice man. He says, believe it or not, we make much more money trading oil than looking for oil, <laughs> which <laughs> says something about. So they wanted some heuristics for me to find some heuristics for the spot market. It was a very interesting question. I was, and I was working with, a, with an intelligent person who was helpful. And it's not surprising that the data was seasonal because of the needs of our own. And um, for all those years, something like 10 years, I had data. Uh, the maximum uh, uh, in storage, the maximum amount of products in storage were typically the end of May. Unleaded gasoline, Americans were getting ready for their summer driving, what have you. In every year this was true, except one. February of 1990 was the maximum for the year 1990, and bigger maximum than the normative. So of course I called them up, I said, there's a mistake in the data. Said, no, no, it's really like that. It's just going crazy. What the hell's going on? And I checked it. It's with billions of dollars. It's not like somebody bought. And uh, speaking about stories, I live close to the desert. Sometimes even in the desert, I start thinking. I said, wait a minute. Uh, this great philanthropist, Saddam Hussein, went into Kuwait in August of 1990. Now, you don't just walk in. You have to prepare. So you send material and trucks and what have you. And if you know desert, if you drive a truck, drive a truck in the desert, it takes about three days for the dust to settle down. I mean, you can really, there's a lot of information just looking around. And of course, in the desert, there are lots of Bedouins. So I surmise that these guys tell Bedouins, if you see anything unusual, tell me, and here's some money. So clearly the Bedouins were telling us there's a lot of stuff moving in the south towards Kuwait. It was not such a big, perhaps, idea that maybe something is cooking. So these, these companies bought oil like crazy at about $15 a barrel. 
they sold it at about $75 a barrel in November after he had gone into... So they really know what they were doing. But just to kind of reinforce my speculation, I was able to trace it because I was getting it every week or whatever. And I could see that an enormous amount of jet fuel was being produced. So they were preparing for war. So I gave them the results, which they liked. And I also said, well, there seems to be this peculiarity about 1990. And, and there were some very upset faces. So I left with the remark uh, saying that I hope that the CIA and some other agencies as, as, are, are as well informed as you guys. But, so something about causality. But I was trying my level best to, to connect. OK, sir. No, no, yeah. So it seems that it's very good, uh, like, the parallel coin is very good to find linear correlations. Well, no, 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 what, what did you say linear? How could you possibly? I mean, I can't spot really, like, intersections of lines. No, 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 you missed it. This thing that I showed you about the cocoa commodity market, yeah. this was highly nonlinear. Okay, go ahead. I so imagine that like I have an exponential dependence between one line and the other. I just want to see how distinctive it, it is from the other stuff. How can I spot it? You know, is well, it easier, you, is it you look for patterns. Look, look at this. You cannot spot this. If you could not spot this, I would suggest you visit yeah, yeah, your optometrist. No. Now, I agree that I had to, to choose these two particular variables. Right? No, no. Okay. So. Folks, I'm sorry to cut you off. Uh, okay, right. we'll, cut, we'll continue. Once more. Yes. I encourage this conversation.